Many people are not aware that trapping takes place throughout most of North America. Some have never even heard of it. But like hunting and fishing, trapping is an activity that is regulated by state wildlife conservation agencies for the many benefits it provides. Let's take a closer look. The modern trapper and hunter play an important role in the management of wildlife. Just like hunters who have supported the restoration of many species such as wild turkeys, trappers have also worked with state wildlife conservation agencies on successful wildlife restoration programs. For example, river otters have been trapped in states where they are plentiful, then released in other areas where they were no longer present. Eighteen states have restored river otter populations in this way through partnerships with trappers. Like all wildlife, fur bears such as beavers, muskrats, and raccoons need habitat, a place to eat, sleep, breed, and live. Any kind of habitat, no matter how good it is, only has enough food, water, and living space for a limited number of wildlife. The number of animals a given habitat can support is called the carrying capacity of that habitat. When wild animals become too numerous for their habitat, starvation, diseases, and parasites in the population usually increase, as do negative impacts on other species. Hunters can help to control local deer populations, helping to minimize damage to forest ecosystems. Some fur bears can cause problems too, such as muskrats eating all the vegetation out of a wetland, which has negative impacts on other animals that live there. Like hunting, trapping can remove some of the animals, keeping the populations at more healthy levels. In areas where wildlife and people live close to each other, increases in wildlife populations may result in damage to human property. In some situations, trapping can reduce the amount of damage that fur bears cause to people, including flooding, damage to trees and property, and taking up residence in people's homes and vehicles. Trapping has also been used across the country to assist in the management of threatened and endangered species. By trapping predators that prey on rare species, such as the least tern and piping plover, biologists help restore populations and prevent these unique animals from becoming extinct. Least terns, piping plovers, and sea turtles are just three of the many threatened and endangered species that have directly benefited from trapping. If you ask trappers and hunters how they benefit personally from these activities, most will tell you they provide people who enjoy the outdoors with a way to interact with nature and feel more connected to the land, to put food on the table, and to spend time with friends and family. Trappers and hunters must purchase licenses and follow state and federal laws in order to pursue these activities. State and federal fish and wildlife agencies are working with trappers and hunters to monitor populations and set seasons and bag limits to protect the wildlife resource. These agencies are also participating in a national study to find the best traps and design education programs that teach the best ways to use them. This study will result in a list of best management practices, or BMPs, that trappers can use to become even better and more efficient stewards of the wildlife resource. There are many different kinds of traps and trapping techniques, and anyone who chooses to try trapping needs to become skilled in their proper use. Some of the different kinds of traps include restraining traps. Hunting dogs or other non-target animals can be released from these traps unharmed. The most common style is the foothold trap. In this kind of trap, the animal steps on the pan and the trap closes around the foot, keeping the animal from escaping. Many designs are available that reduce injuries to the captured animal. Foot encapsulating traps are highly modified foothold traps that are extremely species specific, meaning they rarely catch dogs, cats, or other non-target animals. Snares are loops of thin cable that close around an animal's body or foot, holding it fast. Cage traps hold the animals inside and prevent their escape. If the animal is captured in a restraining trap, the trapper must decide whether to release it or dispatch it. If the trapper decides to dispatch the animal, this should be done as quickly and humanely as possible, usually by shooting where allowed by local ordinance. 
Cage traps, foothold traps, and restraining snares are all good choices for multiple use areas because all of them allow the trapper to release non-target animals. Smooth wire traps, commonly called body gripping traps, are designed to catch the animal about the head or chest, resulting in a quick kill. They are similar in function to a mouse trap. Not all types of traps are legal in all states, and just like hunters, trappers should check state regulations every year to learn what is legal before going afield. Like successful hunters, a successful trapper needs to know the habits and habitats preferred by the animals they intend to trap. They must learn what traps to use and where to place them. Responsible trappers make every effort to place their trap sets in areas where they will not catch anything except the kind of animals they are trying to trap. This is especially important in areas where domestic animals might be running free. Like hunters, trappers use as much of the animal as possible. In order to sell or use the fur, the trapper must learn to skin the animal and prepare the pelt. Some trappers eat the meat of the animals they trap, and others give or sell the carcasses to the rendering industry, which processes them into a variety of household products such as paint, soap, and construction materials. Responsible trappers use as much of the animal as possible, so nothing is wasted. Just as in hunting, safe and responsible behavior when trapping is critical to the future of this activity. At a minimum, trappers should get permission from landowners before trapping on their land. In some states, trappers must have written permission from landowners to trap their land. Take care to place trap sets in areas that reduce the chances of catching non-target animals. Use the correct traps and sets for the kind of animals they're trying to catch and check their traps frequently. Many states require that traps be checked at least once every day. Dispatch trapped animals quickly and humanely and use as much of the animal as possible. Finally, trappers should remember to take extra precautions in multiple use areas. People with dogs don't always keep them on leashes. Responsible trappers set their traps to avoid potential conflicts. Trapping has been around for a long time. Since before recorded history, humans have trapped wild animals for food and clothing. Trapping played a very important role in the exploration of North America during the expansion of European settlements. By the late 1800s, states began forming conservation agencies to establish laws and regulations that allowed trapping and hunting to continue, but at levels that would not harm animal populations. Today, most people believe that with proper stewardship, wildlife populations are a renewable resource that can be used for the benefit of society. If you'd like to learn more about trapping, consider attending one of the trapper education courses that are offered in most states. These courses are similar to the hunter education course, but are designed to give you the information you need to be a safe, responsible, and successful trapper. Ask your hunter education instructor or contact your state fish and wildlife agency or state trappers association for more information. What you say about trapping and hunting and how you conduct yourself in the field will have a lot to do with whether you'll be able to continue these activities and whether your children and grandchildren will have the same opportunities to trap and hunt as you do.